Thanks for the intro, Manuel. Um, yeah, second to last talk for today, and I guess with uh, Neil Ford coming after me, I'm some sort of a Ford band. Uh, yeah, let's, let's stop the terrible puns. Let's talk about web development. Who in here has done web development before? Quick show of hands. Who considers themselves a web developer? For longer than 10 years. Okay, and out of the remaining ones, who thinks that they can give me a good definition of what hypertext means? Ooh, this is going to be a very interesting talk. Cool. So hypertext. Hypertext is this thing that we have a transport protocol for. You might have heard of it. It's, it's called the... Why is it not working? There goes the beautiful bridge. It's called the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And for those of you who are not familiar, it works a little bit like this. You have a server and a client, and the server sends a request, consists of a, out of a couple of components. The beginning is like what we call a method. Then there is some sort of namespace. Then comes the protocol identifier and a version. That gets sent to the server. The server processes it and sends back a response, again saying it speaks the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which version, a status code tells us is it okay or not, and some more metadata and the actual response. And now, of course, you all know this, right? This is the web as we know it. It's been web development as of, I don't know, 1995 or something. Um, but today, these days, we're not doing web development like this because the thing that annoyed us about that is that it's not interactive, right? There is a single round trip to the server and back for every change that we wanted on the web page. So along came JavaScript, and with JavaScript we got frameworks like AngularJS or React, uh, or then later Angular and Vue and Svelte and all these kind of things. And I'm going to take React as an example here, which, as you can see, that's a pretty default React component, and it takes in some data, and it computes a view based on that data. And that's very easy to understand because it's a unidirectional flow. Right, so we know that unidirectional flow from a different kind of pattern is called MVC. Right? You have a model, it's probably somewhere in use state, the view is JSX, and the controller is all the other code that you write in your application that's sort of spread out of all your code base. And that actually sounds very familiar to how we did web development with PHP. Right? Like the model is the server's database, the view is the HTML that we render, and the controller is the HTTP handler that generated the view. And what's cool about MVC, actually, is its unidirectional data flow. Right? That's what makes it so easy to understand. We take an input from the user, we process it, we apply it to the model, the model again generates a view, and then the cycle continues. So you can already tell it's going to be about circles. And the cool thing is it's a pure function, right? Model plus input equals new model. Super easy to understand. But the problem was that it wasn't interactive, right? We had single round trips to the server, everything that needed to change on the web page, like needed a round trip. And with JavaScript frameworks like React or Angular, we sort of um, came away from that and we actually got interactivity. The question is, at what cost did we get that interactivity? We needed to build tools like Webpack, Gulp, Grant. We had delayed rendering because now we had to ship all of that JavaScript to the front end. All of the bytes had to be transferred. Then we had sort of the application, but the application by itself can't show any data. Then we had to go and build JSON APIs to actually get the data, get it to the front end, because a web shop is no good without any products that are in it. We had heavier web pages, more download of data, so we built more tools around those. Webpack was abstracted away by Vite. All of that data fetching was abstracted away by Next.js. JSON APIs became boring, so we built GraphQL. Angular CI sort of like orchestrated all of the bootstrapping of the project. Th those are all costs, right? Those are all costs that we incurred for the benefit of no more having full page reloads for updating. And I think it's important that we like, take a step back and it's like, why are we doing all of that? The why is we want like partial updates to our web page, not full round trips. As next thing, I want to focus on HTTP for a bit. Because if you ask me, HTTP is pretty damn amazing. 
you've got a uniform interface, you've got status codes, it has a type system, it can do request response, it can do streaming, it has namespaces, caching, content negotiation, rate limiting, redirects, which are, by the way, really awesome. You don't have to break your user if you change your, um, your product. You can just redirect them to, hey, here is the new functionality, and all bookmarks and links will continue to work. We have authentication, compression, we have all these things built in. Now, why am I mentioning this? Well, the, the world where I come from, this stuff doesn't exist. I'm a maintainer of Rustly P2P, which is a P2P networking stack. And we do things like hole punching, distributed hash tables, published subscribe systems, service discovery, and like the, the primitive that we give to our users, which are also developers that want to build peer-to-peer -peer applications, is streams. We give them a stream of like, hey, here is a node somewhere, I don't know, maybe it could be on a mobile phone, to like some server somewhere, and you can just establish bi-directional streams between those and send data. But that's it. It's just one byte after the other. So you have to do all your own protocol design and all these kind of things. And when you're in that world, realizing what HTTP actually gives you, sort of, it, it's just a great protocol. Now, I remember on the last CodeCrafts, David gave a talk, and when he got introduced, he got introduced with this metric, time to Kafka. Like, how long does it talk, take for David to give a talk before he mentions Kafka? Well, so the, the applicable um, metric for me is like, how long is Thomas going to talk about something before he talks about REST? And I think we're at 7 minutes and 12 seconds now. So what is REST? Well, REST is an architectural style. It's an acronym for representational state transfer. And it's really about constraints and properties. And I know that's not a really good explanation. That's like some, something I took out of Wikipedia. But really, what it's about is it gives you, whenever we talk about design, design is purposely constraining things so that we, have, we can take away a benefit. And REST does the same thing on an architectural level. It tells us, this is the box you can play in, and you can build your system however you want, but don't leave this box. And then we can guarantee you that your system will have certain properties. That's all like the idea of it. What is not REST? REST is not about arguing whether or not you should be using put or post for your endpoints and using nouns for resources. Like, just because you're using nouns doesn't mean your application is actually RESTful. And it's unfortunate that it sort of has taken this it's taken this path where people feel like they're building beautiful RESTful APIs just because they have collection resources and use post for, post for creation and delete for deletion. So what is actually REST then? Well, if you just leverage HTTP for what it is, you will actually get a RESTful application. And that's not by coincidence. That's because REST was the formalization of all the work that the people in the 90s did when they built the web because they, want, they needed something that ne needed scaling, because they anticipated, which actually wasn't clear at the time, that the web's going to be big, and it's going to be millions of servers, and they're all going to talk to each other, and they run on different versions in different programming languages, all these kind of things. So one of the, th the key things there were that it's going to be client-server, which means separation of concerns. The client has a different responsibilities than the server. That's the key thing of, of client-server. In a peer-to-peer -peer model, every peer can do the same kind of work, same responsibilities. We're going to build it on top of hypertext, which is this idea that you have text that links or refers to other text. We're going to have generic clients that can just parse this hypertext, show it to the user, and the user can navigate themselves through the application. And then we have this thing called Code on Demand and HeyDOS, which is kind of like the ugliest acronym that you could have possibly chosen. So I'm going to explain it for a bit what it actually means. It stands for Hypermedia as the Engine of Application State, which is quite a mouthful. What does that mean? Well, Hypermedia is sort of like one level up from hypertext, where you don't have text that links to other text, you have text that links to media. And we all know this because in HTML we have the IMG tag, that can reference an image, and we have the anchor tag that can reference another HTML site. And then the application state is really probably in your database. It could be in memory, but probably in a database. And so the idea is, this is actually, this isn't, Hadros isn't something that you can just download a library for and put it into your application. It's a mindset of how you're designing your application. Like it's the idea that you're using hypermedia, which is like references, as the engines or as the thing that drives your program to change your application state. 
So like change your application state through form submissions and allow the user to explore that application state with links. Now, why isn't this more popular? Well, the issue is that vanilla HTML is actually very poor. Like we have anchor tags and they always trigger get. And we have forms that can trigger get and post requests. And the response always targets the body. Right, we click on a link, so the browser goes, fetches that web page, and he replaces the entire body. Right, that's the thing that we don't want. What if I told you that there's a way that any HTML element can trigger any HTTP request? And that's where a library called HTMX comes in. I didn't write it, but I'm a huge fan. And the idea is any element can trigger any HTTP request, get, post, put, delete, whatsoever. And the response can target any HTML element. Now, how does that work? Looks like this. We have two attributes, HX post and HX swap. So if we click on that button, we're going to issue a get request to whatever domain we're on slash clicked. And whatever the response is, actually, it's going to be a post request. And whatever the response is, we're going to swap the outer HTML, so the thing that the button is contained in, for that response. And that all happens via HX, so it's in the background. What else can we do with it? Well, here's a pretty vanilla HTML snippet. The only thing that's different here is we have this HX boost attribute. And what that does, this is just like black magic when you see it for the first time. It goes through the entire children of this DOM element, checks for all hypertext elements, so links and forms, disables the default click handler, instead sends an HX request in the background, retrieves the HTML, and swaps out the differences. So here you have a static HTML page that if the user has JavaScript enabled, <coughs> progressive enhancement, then all of these forms and links, they will just appear to automatically swap out only the bits that changed, and the rest of the UI state just stays the same. And now you're going to say, but Thomas, like, this is stupid. We're going to have so many HTTP requests. Like, this is going to be really slow and a constant round trip back to the server. No good. Well, let me tell you this. It's not 2010 anymore. We, the web is pretty quick because we have Quick now, which is literally the best thing since sliced bread in networking. It's a UDP-based protocol, and we can do zero round-trip HTTP requests on top of UDP, all encrypted with TLS 1.3. Every modern browser and CDN supports it. You're probably using it without even knowing that you're using it, because browsers just upgraded and servers just upgraded. Now, what does that mean? Well, the Typical MTU for a UDP packet is 1,500 bytes. There's a bit of overhead with all the framing and the encryption signatures whatsoever, but we get an effective payload of about 1,300 bytes for that UDP packet. That's like the single thing that can be sent over the wire, be it Ethernet, Wi-Fi, whatever, um, as a single chunk, right? There's no chunking up of that data, just goes to the server and back. What does that mean in action? Well, in action, we can see HTTP2, it's already fairly fast, at least we can reuse a TCP connection, so this doesn't include the handshake of TCP. But with HTTP3, you can see all of the like SSL initial connection just goes away. We make an HTTP request in 18 milliseconds. Now this is from a hotel room somewhere to a Cloudflare CDN. Um, it's, I don't know, if you care about performance, you're going to host your application on Cloudflare because why would you think that you can do it better than them? Um, so we have 18 milliseconds. To put that into perspective, the human eye needs 30 seconds, 30 frames per minute per second to perceive fluid motion. That's about 30 milliseconds. I can send one HTTP request per frame and render something, and it's still going to be fluid motion for the human eye. This is how fast the web actually is in 2023. So now you're going to tell me, well, Thomas, we don't need all of this. We have React server components now, and they are going to solve everything. Because that's not just the JavaScript library. We need some tooling and bundler support, but what we can do is we can describe our UI once, and then 
it's going to figure out what needs to, what can be rendered on the server and what can be rendered on the client, and it's going to automatically stream all the bits that are interactive to the client. So if we contrast this with the web, web has a language for describing UI, it's called HTML. And we have a protocol for transporting it back and forth. It's called HTTP, right? And it's very well specified, actually, um, and very feature-rich, as we just explored. Now, React has a language for describing UI, it's called JSX. And now, supposedly, it also has like some transport, except if you try to actually look at the spec, it says, the framework is responsible for progressively streaming the rendered output to the client as React renders each unit of UI. There isn't a single description on like what that actually looks like. So chances are Next.js is going to build it differently to some other framework. So it's again kind of like not interoperable, let alone that we still suffer all of the initial download of JavaScript whatsoever um, to actually start rendering. So the question is, have we come full circle? I'm just going to leave this here for a bit. It's kind of the same, isn't it? Like we have a protocol to ship UI bits back and forth, except that we are sort of not specifying it as well as HTTP did, and it's sort of like not transparent to the developer at all. So here come Tom, comes Tom's take. The web is fundamentally client-server. I think we should understand and embrace that. Like the client has a job and the server has a job. Let's not mix those two things because as long as we're still using the web, that is going to keep coming up. Like you're not going to move away from client-server on the web. You are in peer-to-peer -peer space, and there's different technologies applied in. Not caring about HTTP is like being a car mechanic and only doing tires and engines and not transmissions. Like it's sort of like you're missing half the things and sort of like what connects those two bits with each other. And HTML and HTTP are not going away. Like they've been with us for 30 years. They're safe abstractions to build upon. And guess what's not going to break with the next version upgrade? Form submissions. Thanks for listening. <laughs>